next example is just a very simple port scanner. And notice our packages, the net package, abstract Windows toolkit for some of our components that we're going to add in our JFrame. Uh, the abstract Windows toolkit event package because we're going to implement action listener to handle button clicks. And the swing package, again for our J components. Alright, so we have a class port scanner and it extends JFrame. So the class itself is a JFrame. We have a boolean here um, called in, uh, insufficient data for scan. And in this case, you know, that's just in case they don't enter all the field information. And we don't know, if we don't know the range, where to start and where to end, then we can't complete the scan. So we'll use the, that boolean there to toggle things on and off and to do a little bit of validation with our GUI, our graphical form, to make sure we get all the pieces of information we need before we implement the port scan. We have a global socket object, and we have port start, port end, and then port start and port end, and these will be used interchangeably, but you know this is just so that the user can enter the start and end values in the J frame. We have string target, which will be the host name or IP address, and then main window, which is a new frame, it will be called port scanner, and some labels and text fields that go on it for the start and end. And then sort of a you know status or you know message area here with the scroll pane. That's the text area there. So we can see the results of our scan. And then some J buttons, scan and reset. Okay, so those are all our globals. So the static main method is the first function that would be called automatically when we run this program. And what does it do? It simply builds or instantiates a port scanner object. And what does that do? Well that calls the constructor. And the constructor then turns around and calls build GUI. And the build GUI function will go through. And main window, which if you look up here, that was our frame. It's going to add all the components to our frame. And this time we're going to use a layout manager. Good layout because it's sort of a simple, you know, small J frame here. So we're going to add some components to a, a, a panel. And set our layout manager to grid layout, in this case 3 and 3. And we're going to add components to it, and then we're going to add them to our frame. That's all we're doing here. I'll try to scroll really slow so you can see the code and pause if you need to. But when we get down here, just adding some uh, scroll panes and setting the scroll pane for the message so that that way, if they, you know, get a lot of responses or if, if it's a very large range, then they can scroll the text area up and down to kind of get the results. When we get down here, I split this in a separate function, add event handlers. So this function here takes care of adding in, you know, all the event handlers that it needs to add in. And if the window is closing, it's just going to exit with parameter one. If it's the scan button being clicked, it's going to go call B scan action. It just farms it out or passes the buck to this function here as an event handler. If it's the reset button, it's going to go call this method or this function, reset action. Okay, so the the next main part, I guess, then would be, well, the event handler, the scan action, what happens there? We have to make sure that they fill in the required information. So we have to do some form validation here. Um, they have to enter a target, IP, or host. They have to enter a start part, and they have to enter an end part. We, have, we need all three of these pieces of information for... Uh, a complete scan. So if we don't get any of them, if any of them happen to be missing, we're just going to return and this would basically exit the function. Okay. And then we get down here, we're going to um, insufficient data for scan. It's going to be set to false because if none of these returns were encountered, then we did have sufficient data for a scan. So that would be set to false. And we'll clear the text area just in case there was anything there from the previous scan. And here we're actually going to you know, launch a new thread object. So thread x1, it's a new thread. And I'll scroll down so you can see the closing brace way down here. There's the closing brace. So within that thread, this is the thread's run method, doing a little bit of nesting here. And we're going to do some things here as far as our scan button. It will be disabled. And we'll change the text, the caption property on our reset button. Instead of saying reset, it'll say stop now. And we're going to get text, in this case, from the text field target, which will be the IP address of the host name. And after we do that, we're going to get the start and end ports 
and we have to convert it to an integer. Remember that with a text field it always comes in a string data, so we're going to do some parsing and convert it to an integer. Then once we do this inside this for loop, we're going to simply loop through from the, you know, in this case the starting port to the ending port on that particular IP address. And how do we do that? We're going to display in the status port blank is being tested. And then if there is insufficient data for the scan, just to make sure we need all those pieces of information, we're going to break. We'll exit the for loop. But if everything's good, copacetic, cool, we have all the information we need, this try block is going to execute. And in this case, on the IP address or the host name, and then X, which represents the port, and the port is going to go from, well, look, there's port start to port end, right? So this whole loop is going to go from the starting port to the ending port. So it's just going to basically try to instantiate or open or create a new socket uh, bound to that IP address or that host name and that port over and over and over and it's going to test it. If it's successful, it's going to say port is open and then it's going to close it and keep looping or iterating and try the next port. But if it can't, if something goes wrong and that port's not open, then here we're going to go down to the catch statement. You know, we bust out of the try and we get down to the catch statement. And we're going to say the port is closed. So either the port is open or the port is closed based on whether or not we're in the try or the catch. And then when we get all done outside of our for loop and we've scanned all the ports, we're just going to set everything back. Scan will be re-enabled. Instead of saying stop, reset, the caption or the text on the reset button will now say reset again. And we'll simply change the status, which is a, you know, the, that's a label different from the text area, to press scan to start. All right, so all of that is sort of nested. We're just, you know, creating a thread on the fly there. And once we do that, we have to, you know, start it. We're going to go call the start method on the thread, which will then turn around and execute its run method, which is nested inside there. Okay. And then finally, we get down here, what happens when they click the reset button? Well, insufficient data for scan is set back to true, just in case, uh, you know, we need to make sure again that on the next scan we get all the required information or else we don't let them scan. And then we're going to, you know, as a matter of convenience, we're just going to clear out all of those text fields so they don't have to erase it themselves. And we're going to change this, in this case, you know, the reset button, set text will be set to stop. All right. So, um, you know, you could do a lot more with this. You could certainly add a lot more to it, polish it a lot more, but just kind of illustrating once again how sockets work. It's a very simple program. So let's run it and see what happens. And let's see, come up, drag it in here. The port that I'll test, I'll use my loopback. One, do one two seven dot zero dot zero dot one. And the starting port I'll do is one three five, and I'll end at one four five. Okay. I'm gonna click scan. Notice one thirty five is open, and one thirty six. All the way through 145 is closed. But you can see how that works, and that just showed me an open port. And I could scan another IP on the network if I wanted. We could also write a ping sweeper uh, utilizing the previous example, in which case we could just, you know, in a for loop or a while true loop, we could try to open up sockets one at a time and just slowly increment. Uh, you know something within a subnet range and convert it to a string with it to string method and we could just you know pass it in as the argument to the sockets constructor so that's one way and then also another way would be um, in this example here I'm just using a command line tool on Windows and if I were to run it you can see I'll go ahead and run this let me pull this up here there you go so you can see that's that's pretty much one command there. It's just ping in and there's you know, one echo reply there. But each one of these would be a command line switch or space. Okay. And this is, you know, in this example I'm not using a socket, but I am using a process builder and still a buffered reader. Okay, and then as another example, um we haven't got into this yet, but we will in other videos. 
we're going to start look, uh, talking about interfaces and datagrams and other you know means of, of coding network projects and things. And this is just showing you another way of doing it. Um, so two different ways, but but based on the previous example, right? Example two, the port scanner. It wouldn't be very difficult at all to just take that same code and instead of trying a bunch of different ports, try a bunch of different IP addresses. And there you'd have a ping, uh, ping sweeper. All right, so now you have three different ways of creating a ping sweeper in Java.